Um, thank you. So I'm going to try to weave a few pieces of, um, of this talk together. I want to start by talking a little bit about Aldo Leopold and his sort of evolution of thinking, the way he learned to think in some ways, um, particularly in relation to fire. And then I want to use that to kind of set a stage for um, fire in Wisconsin and things that I've been um, learning about, testing assumptions um, and uh, some of the way we think about fire in this state. And then I want to try to bring those two things together at the end and, and maybe even more specific to, um, to where we are here. So one of the best known uh, writings of Leopold's is Thinking Like a Mountain, which is in Sand County. And it's, it's, here is a quote from that, um, that, that essay where he says, I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. So he's describing an experience when he was 22 years old, a brand new Forest Service employee um, in 1909 in the Apache National Forest, which was then in the Apache <coughs> territories. So Arizona wasn't a state yet. 1909, um, and, and so, you know, he, he actually, it's, it would be easy to think that he had this epiphany and just changed, but that's not actually what happened. It took, um, it took years, decades for his thinking to change on the topic of predators and, and, and predator control. And he organized um, game protection associations to eliminate predators and his, uh, when he was a young man. So he's really writing about something that took place 39 years prior at this point. He started in 1909. The very next year, 1910, was one of the biggest fire years we've had in this country. Um, it it uh, burned 3 million acres in the um, Idaho-Montana border. It burned up in the Northwest, maybe collectively 20 million acres in the West. Um, and, and it was a big fire year. So, he was very much a man of his time in terms of predator control and also in terms of fire suppression. So here's from a paper he wrote called Paiute Forestry vs. Forest Fire Prevention in 1920. And at this time, he was the assistant district forester in charge of forest protection, so fire suppression, on 20 million acres of public land in the Southwest. And he basically says that, you know, he, he, he at this time is concerned about an erosion problem, but he's essentially saying here, yes, cattle are a problem, but at least we're getting tree regeneration without the fire. So he, he's obviously, um, you know, cattle have thus unwittingly restored the forest to its lost provinces. So he's making the argument that we're getting great tree regeneration and, and, all, and all is as well. So, but he, as part of his job, he visits the different forests and he has to write these, these forest service reports. And actually some of these reports are some of his more interesting writings because they're less polished, they're more sort of gritty and to the point. Um, and he also uh, has courage that is sometimes missing in his more you know, uh, peer reviewed publications. But anyway, so he visits the Prescott National Forest and he is deeply concerned about the erosion problem. Um, all through the Southwest. It's becoming evident, you can't ignore it, but he really was um, one of the early thinkers in terms of erosion and some of the, the impacts and the reasons why. And so he starts to figure out that there's something going on. It's linked to grazing, it's linked to a lack of, of grass, it's probably linked to fire and all of these changes are coming together. Um, and he says we should restore the grass, which all evidence indicates is better watershed cover than either brush or woodland. Now this is interesting. So one of the main points that he makes in this report is that watershed, that at that time, the Forest Service, the National Forests were really set up for watershed protection. 
We weren't cutting timber on our national forests until World War II. We just didn't need it. We had more than enough timber. We really didn't have a need for our timber. So the forests were set up largely around watershed protection and around fire control. So he's making the link between fire now being a better protector of watersheds and that maybe it has an essential role. So he's really, this is pretty revolutionary at the time. In fact, we're just starting to come to grips with it now, really. So the very next year, 1923, same thing, he visits the Tonto National Forest and he's writing his report. Now he's more sure of himself. He's, he's clear that without fire, we're having this cascading effect. He says, there's no evidence that even the severe fires of pre-settlement days destroyed the equilibrium of the watershed. The Tonto bears out my observation on the Prescott that there is a lot to be learned about the behavior of brush fires. So um, this, this is a, a really early sort of switch. So he's, he's having a, an evolution in his thinking. He's, he's learning in, this, in the west, Southwest, he's really learning through his observations on how to think systems, systems wide, whole systems, not just a piece. We're really, all of us are really good at getting really good at narrow things. I'm, I do that too. I, I pretty much fire is my narrow thing. But Leopold was able to really put a lot of pieces together and think about the system. And really in order to do that, if you think about it, he not only had to reorient the way he saw things and make sense of it, he had to reorient his values. So in predator control, he valued deer, you know, and he had to, that's really a value change, and that's a hard thing to do. Um, I love this picture, 1925, same forest he's talking about. That is probably a three, at least a 300-year-old, maybe a 500-year-old ponderosa pine, and he's posting a sign, you know, basically the equivalent of Smokey Bear sign on it of today. Notice this injury. So these are basal injuries caused from frequent fire. They don't kill the tree, but um, they record fire. So those trees have thick bark. They're well adapted to survive fire. Their branches, high canopy base heights, high up in the ground, off the ground. So they're adapted for fire. And he's posting a, you know, keep fire out sign on a, on a fire scarred tree that's 500 years old. So, so he's, He's making this change in his own philosophy and thinking about the role of fire through erosion, trying to do some thinking about erosion problems. But he's not 100% there yet. So the same year as the, his Tonto Forest report, he says, you know, he's talking about um, in this publication, Wild Followers of the Forest, the Effect of Forest Fires on Game and Fish, right? So he says, fire is the scourge of all living things, but goes on to admit um, that when you get these fire, you, you, fires in the forest, you get this plethora of species that benefit. So it's, this is evidence of some of the benefits of fire. But he goes on to say, for this exception to an otherwise black record, let the fire devil have his due. So he's waffling. He's not 100% sure that he's got it. And remember, he only came out with those strong connections so far in the Forest Service report. So the very next year, he writes one of his most comprehensive papers to date, dealing with this subject, certainly, and he brings it all together. Native Americans and cultural reasons and geology and soils and flora and fauna. And he writes this amazing paper and publishes it. And essentially, um, he, he's tying it all together. He who runs may read at will. It was not until fire ceased and grazing began that abnormal erosion occurred. And this is the kind of stuff that he was seeing and we've continued to see in our national forest. Those are repeat photos. He goes on in that paper to say, amazingly, you know, cattle are reducing the grasses. Grasses were the fine fuels that were carrying fires. Fires were what kept the brush in control. So he's putting all these pieces together, but he doesn't just say grazing is bad and we need to eliminate it. Instead, he says wholesale exclusion of grazing is neither skill nor administration and should be used only as a last resort goes on, we're dealing right now with a fraction of a cycle involving centuries. We cannot obstruct or reverse a cycle, but we can bend it in what degree remains to be shown. That's a pretty amazing thing, you know. Um, as a per, sort of a protectionist view would be, get the cows out, they're bad. But he didn't have that, you know, and he also realized that we're dealing with things that have happened over long periods of time, 
and we'll change them over time. So I have to throw in Herbert Stoddard. So Leopold goes to the southeast. Herbert Stoddard is one of my heroes. He's, he's a, um, a biologist, high school educated, and uh, no uh, higher academic degree. He's a friend of Aldo Leopold's. He's a Wisconsin boy. And he goes from Wisconsin, the quail, wealthy quail bio, uh, owners in the southeast wanted to know why the quail are declining. And, and they brought Herbert Stoddard in to investigate that problem. And in doing so, Stoddard sees the whole picture. He's, he's, he's like Leopold. He writes the sort of uh, definitive book on Bob White quail, but in doing so, he figures out an entire system of ecology and of civil culture. So the longleaf pine system in the Southeast is one of the most fire loving systems there is. It burns one every one to two years. It is the most fire dependent system. We, it may be in North America. So the Southeast burned a lot. So here Herbert Stoddard's in this really neat system, figuring out that quail need fire and, and way beyond that, the whole ecology of that system and how fire operated. And the foresters of the day were hanging him out to dry. They would have none of it. Called him the enemy of the forest. When Leopold returned from visiting Stoddard, he was, he was, he was determined. He really felt pretty confident about the role of fire and fire ecology. But he also was writing to a friend in this unpublished letter. And he says, the common assumption is that Stoddard sacrifices forestry and erosion control to gain for quail. But it seems more likely that his opponents are sacrificing game, forest safety, and forest value for their desire to apply the usual rules to an unusual ecological setup. So the Southeast is pretty amazing. And Leopold goes and visits Stoddard, his friend, and really uh, doubles down on his, his, on his thinking in terms of fire. Now at this same time, so Herbert Stoddard was invited by the Society of American Foresters to speak in Georgia, only to boo him off the stage. They literally set him up. Now he's hailed as a hero. He basically changed forestry, and we call him one of the earliest examples of uh, what we call now ecological forestry, or mimicking dis natural disturbance processes to manage timber. So at that same time, long before Smokey Bear, there was a campaign to send a parade. They walked 30,000 miles. They drove trucks and walked all through the deep south, convincing southerners of the evils of fire and to quit burning their woods. And they, they gave o over 2,700 lectures. They had rolling movies. So their whole purpose was to get fire off the land. And amazingly, in spite of all of this, probably largely because of Herbert Stoddard, the Southeast today has the, the biggest fire use program anywhere in the country. They burn two million acres a year. The Western United States that we hear so much of, they don't have fire use program, they have a fire suppression program because it's knocking on their doorstep whether they want it or not. Things are burning up 100,000 acres at a time. But in the Southeast, they prescribe burn two million acres a year. Nowhere else is, is even close to that. W Wisconsin is maybe 20,000 acres a year if we're lucky. Two million acres. So somehow the Southeast maintained its fire culture. And so to kind of put a cap on this story, this is a picture of Aldo Leopold and students at the UW Arboretum. Of course, um, this is the first, uh, Aldo Leopold and um, John Curtis planted the first restored prairie maybe in the world uh, purposeful so they it, it's the it's the curtis no is it uh it's a curtis or the curtis green prairie one of the prairies at the uw arboretum but this is a this is a very early um you know this is early restoration and really from this spawned a whole discipline of, of restoration ecology of which fire is an important tool so there they are with their you know gunny sacks putting in a black line in order to do a prescribed burn. And this is, a, uh, actually the, the quote comes from his 1933 book, Game Management. Land can be restored by the creative uses of the same tools which herefore have destroyed it, the ax, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So again, it, a protectionist would simply say, uh, grazing bad, cow bad, but that's not Leopold. He, he, was, he was not, he was a much more holistic thinker.
So jumping forward to the present situation, I think all of us in this room can appreciate that these are fire dependent communities and we know that they need fire, probably relatively frequent fire to be maintained. So here's a quote from Stephen Pine, one of the, our, our best fire historians. He's a really brilliant uh, writer and was a smoke jumper. He's, he's earned his credentials in the fire world, but a really neat guy. And I know it's a long one, but I think it's important. He says, today, the Northeast is a minor feature in America's pyrogeography. Its fire scene has shriveled to a vanishing point. Wildfires have, it seems, gone the way of Pennsylvania's bison. Prescribed fires struggle to become more than boutique burns. A fire infrastructure scrambles to maintain itself, finding closer bonds with Canada than the rest of the US. The region could drop off the map and no one would notice is essentially what he's saying there. And he's right. So the Southeast burns 2 million acres a year. They're maintaining their fire dependent communities and their systems. And we basically burn little gardens. We are gardening with fire. And that's a problem. So this is work done by Amy Allstadt at the U Univers at UW. And so Amy went back. So Curtis put in plots um, in the 1950s, early 50s, and then they were resurveyed in the late 80s, and then Amy went back and resurveyed them in the late in the um, 2000s. And essentially, we have kind of a trend. So from when Curtis, from from when Curtis set up these sites to the first time they were surveyed, soil moisture was really the the, the definitive factor of what places did well and which ones didn't. And what we've seen is an increase in invasives, primarily brush species, but, but exotics, and a decline extinctions in native species. It's almost universal. And so Amy Allstadt went back and resurveyed those, and what she found was that the rate of invasives has gone up exponentially, the rate of native extinctions has also gone up exponentially, and the definitive factor of how sites are doing is patch size matters and whether or not it's seen fire, period. Fire is very important. And so I had a chance to work with a group of people on what we called the fire needs assessment. And this was really a way to evaluate where we have the best chance to use fire to maintain fire dependent communities in the state. So it was a big spatial exercise. A lot of thinking went into this. Um, and essentially, this is a, a map of like our, you know, and this, what was different about this exercise is that we didn't just say oak savanna and tall grass prairie are critically endangered systems, that's where we're going to burn, or these are the most fire dependent systems, that's where we're going to burn. We said, where, period, do we have the, the, the best opportunity to use fire? So it took it into a cost benefit framework. So the number of, you know, the wildland urban interface, the number of neighbors, the number of, you know, how big the parcels were, what the adjacent property looked like. So it was a, it was a lot of thinking went into that. And what you'll notice, there's some interesting things. One is that we ought to be burning more than a million acres a year. That's never gonna happen and we know that, but it's a big number uh, to maintain fire dependent communities. But this is also pretty interesting. Out of all of the systems we looked at, we have the least amount of opportunity to do anything with tall grass, prairie, and oak savanna. That doesn't mean we shouldn't manage them, but it, there's a whole lot of opportunity that we've been ignoring, is the way, is, or at least not giving uh, attention is part of the way I read that. And so if you give me an elevation in a state, I can tell you something about the fire regime probably because it's temperature on a mountain where there's lots of topography is predictable and therefore precipitation is predictable. As warm air, which can hold lots of moisture, rises and cools, it has to let go of the moisture. Cold air can't hold as much moisture. So it's really wet and cold up here. It's probably um, in between here and it's really hot and dry down here. So I can tell you with some educated guests of fire regime, the way things might have burned those systems without ever having been there. Now carry that to Wisconsin and all bets are off. It's just more complicated. It's more difficult. And so taxonomists have given us a really neat bunch of systems, right? So Laurentian Acadian, which just means northern as opposed to southern, Jack Pine Barrens and Forest. 
Lawrence Chincadian Northern Pine Oak, pine, Northern Pine, Pine Oak Barrens, Great Lakes Pine Barrens, and these all have their equivalents as you move south into the, below the Laurentian zone. In other words, we have all these systems. If anybody can tell me the difference on how they burn, I'd love to hear it. I don't think we can. We don't really know that. It's taxonomists that have given us those systems, but we really don't understand the mechanisms. And so many of those have been so manipulated before we had a chance to really know them. And this is an important point. So much of the way we think about disturbances in these systems is based on structure. So we're basically using structure as a proxy. And where that data comes from largely is from the General Land Office um, Public Land Survey System. Are there folks in here, anybody know what I'm talking about with the GLO data, General Land Office? So at the time of settlement, so Wisconsin had to be cut up into township range sections. Every, every, every place did. Although it started, uh, it started, a lot of settlement happened on the East Coast before this got really organized. But in Wisconsin, from 1832 to 1866, the government sent out surveyors and they had to walk straight lines and figure out township range and section. They gave us a grid of the entire country. And on each corner, each section corner, they had to have witness trees. So they went and they measured the distance and the direction to each of these witness trees and the species. So from the species data, we have a pretty good sense systematically of what occurred where. And from the distance and direction, we can figure out how dense they were. It's coarse data. We're talking a handful of trees per square mile, but it's, it's, it's a really um, useful snapshot, at least, of, of what was here pre-European settlement. When I say pre-settlement, that's what I'm referring to. So we've done, we've, we've, we've interpreted those general land office notes in many different ways. And here is one interpretation, trying to understand disturbance regimes in this area. And so you get things like, you know, first of all, severe wind and fire. The general land office notes cannot detect low severity events. So we're dealing with kind of a unique circumstance there. And they also, uh, you know, it's pretty coarse. So I can tell you, you will not have red pine, jack pine, or white pine if these species don't see fire more than every 400 to 3,000 years. The longest fire rotation intervals they calculated for some systems was 90, over 90,000 years. I used to joke that the bottom of Lake Superior would burn more frequently than that. And then I recently learned about um, trees that are uh, 200 feet deep in Lake Superior. So it might not be that far off actually. But essentially they're, they're useful the general land office notes, but they can only tell us so much about an area and they also are limited to the kinds of th questions you can ask. Okay, so here's your first quiz. This is a picture and it's grainy, even without projecting it onto a screen. It's a, it's a historical photo. It's, the picture is taken from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. These are people right here and here in the foreground. Um, and the quote actually comes from the Northwest Sands from um, a late 1800s uh, geologic survey. The timber occupying these tracks is peculiar and does not justify the application of the term barrens. So one thing that I like to ask people is if you had to guess the density of that forest as a savanna, how many people think it's a savanna? How about a woodland, which would be the next densest? Maybe one, two, three, a few, got some more hands. So what, lots of woodland. Anybody think it's dense forest? Okay, so we're, we're split a little bit, few forest, forest or woodland. Well, I've used, so first of all, I've highlighted what I think are those basal injuries from frequent fire forests in those circles. And you can see char in some of these trees as well. So I've used kind of standard uh, delineations and that's really an academic exercise of what makes a forest, for, right? But I have, counted every stick in that picture, estimated area, and tried to figure out the answer to the question I just asked you. And I am pretty sure that that is solidly in the forest density classification. So basically you are looking at a forest in that picture. And when we look at the general land office notes, as Bollinger and others have, this is the way we interpret this. These are different tree species the general land office surveyors recorded. So bur oak. Almost all bur oak is at a density such that it's savanna. 
A very little bit of it is open enough to be considered prairie. On the other end of the spectrum, almost all hemlock is closed forest. A very little bit of it would be open, you know, would be um, woodland or savanna. So that's the way you interpret the, the, that access. But what you'll notice is so many of these species, like red pine is almost entirely woodland and savanna. Uh, white pine, a good portion of it is, is open. So, so there's a gradient there, but I would also remind you that the, the mixed pine picture we just saw is part of this black. It's considered a closed forest. <coughs> if my estimating of area and counting of stems is right. So jumping into some of my work, um, this is me standing next to about a 400 year old red pine up in the northeast sands of Wisconsin. So have, has anybody seen these before, these basal injuries? A cat face. So you can see individual fires on this tree. Again, this is a fire uh, tree well um, adapted to survive um, and, and actually require fire. So I want you to watch that tree for a minute. So we do see a few of those in Wisconsin, but not many. We see a lot more of this. So this is what's left of probably 99.99% of the trees I just showed you or more. I mean, they're basically completely gone. So these were cut at the time of settlement, European settlement, and basically the entire tree rotted away except for leaving that cat face, which is really resinous because it was injured and sealed up with resins by the tree. So this is where I've been working all through basically the sands landscape or where there's sandstone down in the um, Driftless area and Baraboo Hills. And we've been busy. We've been uh, collecting old stumps and old um, logs and uh, some old living fire scarred samples. And what we do with those is we are able to look at the narrowness of the rings. And so some, some trees will have bark on them and we can basically do a count, but most trees we actually have to use patterns of tree ring thickness and we look for signature drought years and so we're able to, to date those in what we call cross dating. It's a lot of work but it's fun and this is the kind of stuff we get from that. So this is just a, a representation of some sites. So almost everywhere we go in, this, in Wisconsin, so all of these sites more or less are the mean fire return interval is about six to 10 years, way more frequent than, than we ever believed. Remember the fire rotation numbers I showed you with red pine being upwards of, I don't know, what was it four or 500 years, something? That's a rotation interval, not a return interval. It's a little different, but they're orders of magnitude off. So down here, it's even more frequent. So these are a couple of sites in the Northeast Sands. There's one in the Northwest. The way you look at these is each one of these lines is a stump, or if it comes out to the end, it was a living tree. And every one of these little hashes is a fire. So this has maybe, I don't know, 20 stumps and a few trees that show lots of different fire dates. And then the fire dates at the bottom of each of these are fires that show up in, um, among multiple samples, so it's replicated. So what we can see are we see some really synchronous fire years among sites. This first uh, fire, 1780, is one that we know something about. 1780 is actually recorded in the newspapers on the East Coast. It was the dark day of New England. It burned, there were so many fires burning in, the, in May of 1780 that it blackened out the sun along the Eastern seaboard and people started running to church. They thought it was rapture. They didn't know what was going on. Chickens were going to roost. People were literally freaking out. And then the ash followed and dumped about five inches of ash over as many states. So big fire years burning in the Lake States and Ontario. That's 1780. So we know something about that fire. Does anyone recognize that date if you can see it? 1871? Bingo. Good work. Festigo fire. So we know a few of these dates. We know that 1871 burned 1 1.2 million acres in Wisconsin. And there are others. So let's go to that Peshtigo fire. So the Peshtigo fire was a October fire of 1871. And typically we think of these as fire years, not fires as ecologists, because the same day as the Peshtigo fire, it was burned, you know, it burned over two and a half million acres in Michigan. We usually name our fires where they kill lots of people. 
1894 burned all over in Wisconsin and Michigan. We call it the Hinkley, after Hinkley, Minnesota, because that's where 500 people were killed. So we like to name things where lots of people die. That's understandable. But anyways, 1871 was a big fire year. We tend to think of it as quote unquote an anomaly, right? It's an anomaly because it was really destructive and killed a lot of people, true. It was, it burned in the fall of the year in October and it had 80 something degrees and torrential winds, true. It's an anomaly because it was burning in pine slash, right? Well, if we really break that down, look at the footprint of that fire. The Northeast Sands are north of here, where the Pinery is. Look at the place names, Lower, Middle, and Upper Sugar Bush. Has anyone been through Door County Peninsula? How many pines do you see there? Almost none. There wasn't pine slash. We weren't cutting pine. We weren't cutting hardwoods in 1871. We were just getting busy with pine. So the narrative that we've told around that fire is a little bit false. In fact, it's, it's almost completely off. So when we look at some of the biggest fire years that burned over the state of Wisconsin and in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, we see a number of them. Look at this fire. Do you remember my talking about 1910, 20 million acres in the Northwest, um, 3 million acres in Idaho? It's the biggest fire year in the Northern Rockies, maybe ever, ever that we know about. There's been half a dozen books written about it. It burned millions of acres here, and we don't even know about it. And this is 1910. I mean, there's, it's, it's amazing to me. So we've tended to, to simplify our narrative to one fire, uh, the Peshtigo fire, or a handful of fires where they happen to kill people. But we had big fire years in this region. So one of our sites was really close to one of Curtis's plots that uh, John Curtis um, worked on and, and, and really one of his plots that made up the book, The Vegetation of Wisconsin. Um, and this is the fire history we put together for that site. So if we take away part of that history and we wanna focus on cutover and slash fires and we wanna interpret Curtis's plots, this could mean just about anything, right? So Curtis basically was setting up his plots 40 years removed from a quote unquote natural fire regime. Amy Allstadt's work that I showed you when she revisited those and the extinctions went up and the loss of natives went, went up or whatever, <laughs> went up as well, went down. Na the, the extinctions went up and the and, um, colonization of exotics went up as well. So that, that was 100 years removed from a natural fire regime. But if we're, if we're willing to just assume that the fires we know of are anomalous because they were pine slash and they were whatever, slash fires, it really detracts from a history. If anything, these fires, they fit perfectly into a 300 year long history. I mean, we know some of these fire years were big. We, I showed you that map, 1791 is one of the biggest fire years we know of. So I think basically what I'm trying to say here is we have a shifting baseline problem. And part of that shifting baseline is that we just don't know our history very well. And so that's something I'm really interested in. And so I, I've also collected density of, of natural origin red pine stands throughout the state as part of my firework. And this is the picture we see. You know, across the sites where we've worked, we see, you know, a tenfold or more increase in the number of stems. And then, and, and I'll remind you, these are the best of the best. These are our remaining old growth stands. These are sites that maybe were cut over and then never entered again. These are like our prime red pine stands. These are state natural areas. These are special and they're orders of magnitude more dense than they were historically. And if we bring it away from the pine and come south, we see the same thing. This is a brand new paper by Bryce Hanbury and Mark Abrams, where they looked at all through the sort of the Oak Savannah woodland region, 
And they basically found historically that we had more open forest than any other type of system, closed forests or grasslands. And when you come to the current situation, we've definitely lost grasslands to land use, farms primarily, right? We've definitely lost open forest to land use, but we've also lost open forest to closed forest. And that's the big one. There's no bigger loser than open forest. So in other words, the magnitude of loss is greater for open forest than grasslands. And that's actually especially true in Wisconsin. This data is a regional look. And so what I would point out is that we don't have a proxy. There's nothing that approximates an open forest. Well, what would, may, maybe a, a city park, maybe, but if, you, if you're willing to, to think about it in maybe a bird's perspective, you know, a roadside prairie or a roadside ditch or a, a, a cool season grass, you know, field, or those can all approximate a prairie, but there is nothing that approximates an open forest, really. We've just kind of lost them. And when I look at data from this area, from the Driftless area, including data collected on the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, so this is, these, are, these are recruitment dates, so these are when trees are born. And the red bars up here are red pine, Pinus resinosa, and all the green ones are just deciduous. We lumped them. And then down here, these are for hemlock and white pine stands. And the red are for Pinus strobus, which is white pine, and the gray are for hemlock and then deciduous. And what's really fascinating about this picture, I would not expect this. The recruitment is really similar between red pine, a fire dependent species, and, and hemlock, which, which we tend to call a fire hating species. And so that's kind of my point. I think one of the disservices we've done as foresters largely is we've we've come up with these dichotomous categories that you're either pyrophobic, fire-hating, or pyrophilic, fire-loving, and that is just not the way it worked. In fact, even right out here on the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, I'm finding red pine stumps with multiple fire scars on them that were growing contemporaneously with hemlock that still stand right next to them. These things were not just fire-loving or fire-hating. There, there was a fire was ubiquitous and they had to figure out a way to exist or not exist at all. So let's bring it back to Leopold. So Leopold was instrumental in helping set up Coon Valley Restoration Area, one of the first uh, watershed restoration areas, scale restoration areas in the country. And this is, this is what they were dealing with. This was a, a New Deal CCC labor driven um, effort to try to fix that problem. And he remember that quote, right? Land can be restored by the creative uses of the same tools which herefore have destroyed it, ax, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So we removed the cattle off of the steep slopes and we did lots of work in the streams in the bottom. And we, we really, I think, I think we could call Coon Valley a real success. Last summer, we've, we got tested in ways that were almost unprecedented. And in fact, there have been several of these events. The number of intense rain events in southern Wisconsin has gone up 500% in recent years. We are dealing with a new paradigm. And this is what we're dealing with. And what I'm told is that it, maybe, maybe these 11 to 15 inch events, I'm not, ta I'll talk, let's just focus on the inch to two inch events, right? intense precip events, but maybe not that end of the spectrum yet. What I've been told is that the lower reaches of the restored creeks have held pretty well. There are probably people in this room who know this better than me, but that the upper reaches of the watershed are where the problems seem to occur now. So looking at this, you know, we know that this is a, this is a problem, right? It, it's an agricultural problem. It's a land use problem in lots of ways. This is the part of the pie that I think we should start to pay more attention to. That's the, this biggest piece of the pie right here is the forest. And where are those in this, this part of the world? Where are the forests? Where are the woodlands? They're on the steep slopes. Exactly. So thinking about that, 
we know that in the driftless area, we have basically had some changes, undesirable changes. And from a forestry standpoint, we think of those undesirable changes as exchanging high value species for lesser value species. From a watershed perspective, starting where Leopold started, the reason he was looking for the answers of erosion on the forest was because the forests at that time were in charge of protecting watersheds. So if we're thinking about th that in the same context, we're gonna start thinking about when you have white oak, you have light to the ground. This tree grew up with lots of light. The, the next forest growing up under and through and between it is not gonna allow light to the ground. We have oaks in our, in our canopies largely in the driftless area. They're being taken, overtaken by maples. You are not going to have light getting to the forest floor. You're not gonna have the grass that Leopold talked about as being a better protector of watersheds than shrubs or fire control. And so here's another fire history from the Baraboo Hills. Um, Wisconsin estate in 1848, that's about the time that the, the widespread frequent fires ended there. We know there's a long history of fire. The future is yet to be determined. And so going back to that last part of that quote from his 24 paper, Grass, Brush, Timber, Fire in Southeast Arizona, we're dealing right now with a fraction of a cycle involving centuries. We cannot obstruct or reverse the cycle, but we can bend it. And what degree remains to be shown? Thank you.